Scranton Reads, 2008. The Maltese Falcon. Welcome. My name is John McNerney, and this is the second talk in our series on the subject of this year's Scranton Reads project, The Maltese Falcon. The world of the Maltese Falcon is dark. Dark city streets and dark schemes, shadowy corridors and shadowy people. You can't trust the weather or the strangers you meet. Fate seems capricious rather than kind, and danger always seems to be lurking around the next corner. Even in the sunshine, no one's prospects seem bright, and there's a critical shortage of optimism or hope. There's a simple explanation for this bleak atmosphere. Dashiell Hammett was writing what he knew. From his childhood, Hammett learned that the world was a harsh, unforgiving place. He was born in St. Mary's County, Maryland, in 1894. His father was ambitious, but not successful. Not when they moved to Philadelphia, nor in Baltimore. And young Dash had to leave school at age 14, after only one year of high school, to help support the family. He was a newsboy, a freight clerk, a laborer, a messenger, a stevedore, an advertising manager, and then, in a defining moment, a Pinkerton detective. He soon learned that this kind of work was not glamorous. It did not even offer the satisfaction of working for the right side. The young man was once offered money to perform a political assassination of a troublesome labor organizer. He quit the Pinkerton Agency, temporarily as it turned out, after that incident, and it marked the beginning of the development of his radical sympathies in politics. When America entered World War I, Hammett perhaps thought he was lucky to be assigned to the Motor Ambulance Corps and to spend his service at Camp Meade, Maryland, only 15 miles from home. However, while he was transporting soldiers who returned from the European front, many of whom had contracted the devastating Spanish flu of 1918, Hammett became infected himself, and his condition morphed into tuberculosis. It was a cruel twist of fate indeed. TB, as it is still called, a very serious and persistent condition in those days, would hobble and periodically ravage his health for the rest of his life. After his discharge from the service, Hammett went to work again as a detective for the Pinkerton Agency and was involved in a number of interesting investigations, including a high-profile jewelry heist and a mysterious theft of gold from a ship ship called the Sonoma. However, TB struck again, and he was forced to resign from that position, and later from another job as a copywriter and advertising manager. Soon, his most reliable source of income to supplement his disability pay and help maintain his family, he had married a nurse he met in the hospital, and they had two children, turned out to be writing detective stories for a popular pulp magazine called Black Mask. Hammett's stories caught on quickly with the public, were regarded as a cut above run-of-the-mill mysteries, and in 1926-27 sparked the admiration of the aggressive, intelligent new editor of Black Mask, Joe Shaw. With a showman's flair, he promoted the magazine's gritty, hard-boiled detective stories as legitimate literature and touted his stable of popular mystery writers as exciting talents. He urged them to broaden their appeal to a more upscale reading public by writing novels in addition to short stories. Hammett proved to be the star of that stable, and his early novels 
including Red Harvest, the Dane Curse, and the Maltese Falcon, were gobbled up by the public and highly praised by the critics who reviewed them.